Hello and welcome to BTC Radio. I'm Kevin Mitchell, founder of the Business Travel Coalition and your host. Our guest today is Phil Brown, Executive Director of the Greater Orlando Aviation Authority. Phil is one of the most knowledgeable and engaged aviation industry executives in the business today. It's a true honor to have him on the show. Welcome, Phil. Thank you, Kevin. Pleasure today, to be here. Today, we will discuss a few topics. First, the role of U.S. Open Skies policy when airports seek new international service. Second, the economic impact of airlines like Emirates when they enter markets. And finally, how foreign airlines can actually support new domestic competition, which is sorely needed in today's consolidated industry. The United Airlines debacle last week certainly underscored that need. Let's get right to it, Phil. The first question I have for you is, as a non-hub airport, what are the unique challenges that you face at Orlando International and how does U.S. Open Skies policy support your goals to attract new air service? Well, there are a couple aspects to Orlando International. Clearly, we're a non-hub airport. The other is that we are predominantly origin and destination, meaning that we have little connecting traffic. And that's one of the reasons that we are not a, a hub for one of the, the big three airlines, because we don't have that connecting traffic. And the local econ economics drive this as a destination. It's been predominantly a leisure destination over the years, but it's more and more becoming a business destination because some of the high-tech and health services uh, industry that's developing in, in uh, the Central Florida area. Um, you know, prior to 1992, when Open Skies became a reality, the only way that Orlando could get international service was to be named in a bilateral treaty. And since a lot of those treaties were controlled to, to a large degree by the uh, the carriers, that was never uh, that was always a challenge for Orlando. With the advent of open skies, uh, you know, international service became a function of the business economics of flight, uh, and that helped us immensely. I, I'm I don't hesitate to say that the majority of the international traffic we have, which is now about five and a half million passengers annually, annually is, is a function of open skies. Now with 120 countries engaged in it, we have uh, increasingly more opportunities. Um, we've had uh, opportunities in Latin America, Canada, the North Atlantic as well. And uh, last in September of 2015, we got the Middle East uh, service from Emirates, which has benefited us because we are now one stop away from virtually anywhere in the world. Phil, what what is the total number of passengers annually? Uh, since the inception of the traf uh, the the service in in 2015, we've had more than 245,000 on Emirates. If you're talking about the airport itself, we've got 42 million passengers annually, which is a significant increase over the last couple of years. Very interesting. So you you mentioned Emirates. They initiated Dubai to Orlando service, I think, in September of 15. Um, what impact has Emirates had on Orlando travel and tourism, on the economic activity of the area, and job creation? Well, in terms of the passengers, I already mentioned 245,000 passengers, 8,000 tons of cargo. Uh, we've estimated uh, originally that the new flight would have an economic impact annually of about uh, $100 million. Uh, it's surpassed that. It's probably up in the $150 million range. And what we've seen is that the the fact that you can now connect to Dubai, you have access into the Indian market. We have a, a, a fairly significant population of, of Indian Americans in Central Florida, a lot of professionals. We have a lot of universities and, and, and colleges, so we have students as well. And, and the demographics have dictated that there's a lot of travel back and forth to India, and Emirates presents those folks with a, a a very cost-effective and efficient way to make that connection. In addition, you can get to South Africa and as far away as Australia, which has increasingly become a potential market for us. Oh, that's an amazing business model they have. Um, Phil, the big three claim Gulf carriers like Emirates do not stimulate new passenger traffic, but instead steal it from Delta, American, United. Based on your experience with Emirates' new flight, is that flight stimulating new traffic or just diverting passengers from the big three? 
you know, our experience is clearly indicated that it's stimulating new traffic. Um, don't have the specific numbers, but we can we can get those for you. The uh, this, the 245,000 passengers uh, that we see will are coming either directly from the Middle East or from India, and those folks would. Uh, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a big three. It may be a big three partner. Uh, some of the traffic would come over Frankfurt with Lufthansa, which is obviously in the Star Alliance. But we've seen clearly more passengers than we're connecting through those airlines that are on these flights. Interesting. Do you see significant increases in travel to the airport and central Florida coming from the new breed of low-cost long-haul carriers like Norwegian and Azul? Well, Norwegian has obviously had some challenges simply because of their certificate process, but in point of fact, they have started to increase service. We now have service to Charles de Gaulle nonstop that will start at the end of July. We had that service for about seven months with KLM Air France as a part of the Sky Team. Uh, they pulled it seven months after seven months. We've we went to those airlines and asked them to pick it up again after the recession. They declined to do that. So Norwegian has come in and, and produced in that market. Uh, they've also uh, added Copenhagen uh, as a destination on a, on a seasonal basis. Asul is an interesting carrier because they've actually increased their service from Brazil, even in spite of the, the challenges that you see politically and economically in the Brazil market. That was a fast-growing market for Central Florida, uh, and we had um, a lot of service, direct service to Sao Paulo. Uh, and now uh, Asul is not only flying from Sao Paulo, but they're adding Recife uh, and looking at other markets because they see the potential for the Brazilian market to come back. They're a low-cost carrier, and as you know, that Asul's CEO was one of the co-founders of JetBlue, so he understands the U.S. market. He certainly does from for a long time. Let's switch uh, gears a little bit and look at the domestic U.S. market. The day in March of 2014 that Emirates started Dubai to Boston service, its partner JetBlue was able to mount competitive service in the monopolized Boston-Detroit market, driving average fares down by 40 percent. If it was the the passenger feed from Emirates that enabled JetBlue to begin the service, are there opportunities like that at Orlando? I think there are opportunities. One of the opportunities that we see is a connection to Mexico. JetBlue has, has rights to fly into Mexico City. They currently have a challenge because of the slots available to them in Mexico. You know, they're, they, they have some challenges both from Aeromexico Delta as well as the Mexican government, but there is clearly that that opportunity for a feed from Emirates. We see uh, the potential for other locations in the in domestic U.S. to be fed. Uh, L.A. is being an example. Um, so I, I think that's, that's possible. There's also potential for going into other parts of Latin America because uh, JetBlue does serve uh, Colombia as well as the Caribbean from Orlando. Oh, that's very encouraging. They're a great airline. JetBlue. Phil, are you as put off as I am by this notion that, that we, we hear from time to time that the big three own their customers, that they're entitled to their business, and that they shouldn't have to win it each day in the marketplace by offering the best possible service and value? Well, um, I don't know if I'm put off by it. I've grown accustomed to it. It's been a, a theme, particularly from the network carriers, uh, because uh, I think uh, they're used to, at least at the corporate level, to the, the concept of the hub. And and I think there's an argument that because they bring so many passengers into their hubs, particularly their fortress hubs, that um, they're, that's their responsibility. Our view in Orlando, because we're so heavily origin and destination, is that the people are coming because they want to come to the Central Florida area for all the amenities we have to offer. We've got a, a you know world recognized leisure destination. We're becoming more of a business center as well. So the way that we try and approach it to Orlando is that we work with the airlines as well as rental cars and concessionaires and focus on the customer. So it's everybody's customer. And so if there's 
some uh, missteps on the part of an airline if they get backed up. We've got our people that go out and help them from the standpoint of working through issues that they have from time to time. We do that not only with the big three, but with Southwest, with the low-cost carrier Spirit and Frontier. Um, because we clearly, because of the nature of, of our destination, have to be focused on the customer and if we're the first impression when a person gets off the airplane, they don't they don't know whether it's an airport employee or or uh, customs and border protection, whatever. They just think of the experience, and so we we try to work with all the the stakeholders at the airports to create a uniform and pleasant experience. Does that include the TSA? Yes, we work with TSA. We actually have a customer recognition, uh, or excuse me, an employee recognition program that's open to everybody. And we frequently have TSA folks that are recognized because they go above and beyond. Things that we look at are very basic, you know, make eye contact, smile, help the passenger on their way and their destination. And we have a lot of the folks in TSA that, that work toward that end. We always have challenges. We have, you have any large uh, organization, you're going to have challenges, but we have, have worked pretty closely with our federal security director in engaging in that. Well, that explains why you're such a leading airport in the country. Phil, any final thoughts before we uh, wrap up? Well, we talked about em Emirates a great deal, and as you know, there has been a recent announcement that Emirates is, is pairing back its uh, flights into the U.S. market, and the release that I saw indicated there was uh, the impact of the early travel ban in January, as well as the electronic screening process. You know, we've had this discussion at U.S. Travel. I'm one of the, on the board of directors at U.S. Travel. There is concern that we're not as welcoming as we have been. And that's not to say that no one, everyone wants security because that enhances the safety of the traveling public. So I'm a little bit concerned that we have created this impression that we're not welcoming. That's not to say that we shouldn't be mindful of security. We've got a lot of agencies involved in that, and we ought to work closely with those agencies. But we need to, you know, it's dollars and cents for the U.S. International travel has been a major boon to the U.S. economy. It helps the balance of trade payments. Uh, and Orlando is the most visited destination in the United States with 66.5 million uh, visitors in 2015. And a lot of those, you know, almost 60% of those flew in. So I think the economics of it are that we need to focus on safety and security, but we also need to remember that welcome travelers to the United States. They're an economic benefit for us. They create jobs, and we need to be mindful of that. Well, it's a major communications challenge at this point because the confusion has already been stirred up in a lot of markets about whether or not we're welcoming. Phil, thank you for your many insights today. Thank you, Kevin. Well, that's it for this edition. For the entire team here at BTC Radio, thank you for tuning in.